Welcome to the Geek to Geek podcast, where, I mean, who really owns the sky anyway? I'm Void, and I'm here with no my co-host, man. Beige. <laughs> no man's sky. No man owns the sky, because you can't take the sky from me. See, two things. Well said. We are talking about No Man's Sky today. Both of us have played it a bunch. Um, I think I've played it more. How much yes. have you played it at this point? Uh, I've probably put in about 20-ish hours total on it, somewhere between 15 and 20. Okay, and I'm sitting around probably like 40, maybe. And okay. this is because I almost wish that I could have uh, reviewed it and talked about it when I was closer to like 15 to 20 hours because I don't. I, yeah. I, I basically got sick right after we recorded the podcast last week, and... I was kind of done with my billable work for the week anyway, so I pushed through the next day, got billable work done, and then I just like plopped in front of the TV for a couple days. And usually I'm like, you know, very active parent at night, taking care of my kids, doing all sorts of stuff around the house. And by being able to just plop in front of the TV, I basically just played No Man's Sky for like six to eight hours a day for like the next three or four days after that. And my wife took care of everything because she's awesome. <laughs> and so that's awesome. That's kind of the way I've been doing the same way. I've been switching medicines, so it's put me in a really weird like brain fog. So that was where a lot of my No Man's Sky came in. That I was just sitting at my desk since I don't have I don't have a couch in here to be able to uh, to play it like that. So I just sat at my desk and just mined for plutonium, and uh, it was really good considering I couldn't focus on other stuff. So it was it was great for that. So we're coming at it from a similar place, I think. Yeah, and it's not a bad game for that either, and I think we'll no. talk about that when we get into it. Um, I, I just wanted to like start out by saying that's kind of where we're coming from. That's how much we've played of it. I have really mixed feelings about this game, and I feel like we might get into some nitpickiness. So before we do that, I wanted to say that like I really like a lot of the ideas in this game, and I loved the first like 10 or 15 hours that I played it. Yes. Like, there were so many cool experiences in there. There was so much that was fun to discover. And no matter like what we get into here, because there's a lot of things I want to talk about that are interesting or not executed in a way that could or things that could improve. But that first 15 hours, like nothing takes the magic away from that. No, absolutely nothing. This is one of those games where I have, for the first time in my life, understand why video game reviewers have to finish a game before they actually review it. I mean, at least they used to. Growing up, I never understood why they had to actually go through and beat every single game to review it. And after playing this, I understand because it's not as though I don't like it because I do, but I have mixed feelings about it. And looking at the very, very early parts versus right where I'm right at that cutoff of where you said you wished you had uh, reviewed it at. Yeah, I, I'm getting to that point where I'm I'm topping over that that place. I'm crossing that line where I'm seeing I'm seeing the ugliness, and I shouldn't even say ugliness. I'm seeing the blemishes on the game more than I was at the very beginning. And it might not even be like blemishes it might be that you're seeing the edges of what the procedural generation is capable of yeah i mean it may not be that there may actually be nothing wrong i've just hit a limit where yeah. for one way or the, another so um before we get into all that uh so we both like it the first like 10 or 15 hours there's tons of magic there so keep that in mind guys but the the core loop of this game it's basically um an exploration game but the core loop is a little bit more than that. I mean, you can leave a planet, you can go into the solar system, you can go across the galaxy, you can land on planets and investigate things. There's all these little things you can do. But the core loop ends up being basically you gather minerals and isotopes and things like that. But you gather and then you craft and then you travel and then you repeat. And that's kind of the core of the game. It, I mean, from my perspective, anyway, do you think so, too? I do. And I hated it at the very first of it. One of the things that this game reminded me of at the very beginning was the first 30 minutes or so played exactly like EverQuest Landmark that I thought I was going to absolutely despise it because it was a gathering survival game without the building that I wasn't going to have to go craft shelter or anything, but it felt so much like when I started out in Landmark that it looked like Landmark to me too. So it just had this voxel world destructible feeling 
that I wasn't entirely in on. And after I, you know, got used to it, I saw what that loop was, but it took a while for me to actually feel it. But now where I am, absolutely. And like, I I think that I went into this without a whole lot of expectations and I did that on purpose. Like I'd seen um, yeah. E3 trailers from the last few years, but I was basically a media blackout about this game because I saw it a few times and I knew I was going to get it right away and I wanted to form my own opinion. And going into it, I expected it to be a little bit more expensive exploration than it actually ended up being and besides that i didn't have a whole lot of other like um you know initial expectations about it but i i wasn't expecting that the first i would say maybe hour or two is a lot more about like survival and crafting than about exploring and honestly i'm very glad that you picked this up before i did and told me that because if i had if i had picked this up and not known that i'd definitely would have put it back down i never would have picked it back up again because it wasn't the exploration game i expected and it never actually became the exploration game i expected it became a completely different kind of game that i even knew what to expect which is a great thing i love it when games do that but the first couple of hours were so different than what the initial hype had made out in the trailer that i'd seen initially that i just i would i wasn't sure if i would like it at all I mean, heck, right now, I'm not sure if I like it at all, but I like it. (laughs) It's kind of this weird place where while you're playing it, you're not always sure if you're having fun, but it's compelling enough that you keep playing it. And yeah. it, it, it rides this interesting line in between there. Um, I think we'll get back to the core gameplay loop here in a second. But before we got too deep, I wanted to ask, like, what was your favorite thing? You know, just initially getting into this, like, what really wowed you? What what was cool for you right away? I sent you a screenshot of it. Seeing a planet from space where it takes up your entire viewport. When I That was what I absolutely loved more than anything anything else anytime i saw it when i was going in for a planet flying in in my spaceship seeing the planet with its just disc at the entire bottom of my screen and it coming up filled so many different kinds of childhood fantasies for me you know wanting to be this astronaut that it reminded me of when i was at the u.s space and rocket center in huntsville alabama as a kid they did something like that in the big dome imax that we have and i was in my chair so engrossed in it that when the astronaut came down and they went down into the ocean that when they hit the ocean in this IMAX movie I fell out of my chair that I was so engrossed in it like I jerked so hard that I hit with them and that's how I felt the first time I saw a planet from space in No Man's Sky and you know you can't take that away from me it was beautiful and breathtaking and that was what I was hoping the entire game would feel like and it's kind of interesting because for me it was the opposite it was taking off from a planet for the first time actually okay. like when you've powered up your ship enough you have to kind of repair the systems because you start out your crash on a planet um, you have to start gathering resources and repair your, the critical systems of your ship before you can leave your first planet and once you get those like jump jets um, fueled up and fixed you can take off from a planet and it was that first time that i took off from the planet aimed up at the sky and just like hit the boosters and you just like get the sense of pulling away from the ground and then the sky the atmosphere slowly fades out and then suddenly you're in space and like that for me was super powerful was the blasting off and i I never got sick of that like every time i've taken off from a planet I loved it. It's true. And it is the atmosphere slowly fading away that does it for me. That you start seeing a star here, a star there, and just the color fading out to black. That it is, it is so well done. That whoever designed the art for that really, really knew what they were doing to make it breathtaking. Yeah. So I like that a lot. And then my other favorite thing, which was actually the first milestone that I maxed out. Oh, so in this game, there are a bunch of different milestones you can go after. It's kind of like if you want to or not, you're not really required to do any of them. But it's it's kind of different, like just things that you can do in the game. And if you do them enough, you hit these milestones. So my favorite one and the one that I hit max first was collecting alien languages. And you collect ah. them. Yeah, you collect them word by word. And there's three different alien species basically in the game. So you collect all the languages separately but the first time you encounter an alien like they say whatever to you and it's just all like gobbledygook basically Mm -hmm. and the more you acquire these words the more you can start to pick out little words in their sentences and it's translated to english so as you pick up more and more words their sentences make more and more sense and 
I, I still have never gotten to the point where I have a full sentence spelled out, but you right. have enough context clues that you can kind of understand what they're saying. And I thought that was so cool. It's such a wonderful system, too, because you actually feel progression when all it is is just getting a word or two here. You know, you get the you've just learned the geck word for geck. And it's like, that's silly. And then I see it in a sentence and I'm like, oh, I understand why I learned that now. And it's just, it's, it really does feel like a milestone that you are truly learning something and being able to experience a different part of the game. When you, I mean, when it comes to aliens, you said you really liked like the alien ruins too, right? Oh, I'm crazy about ruins. Like my wife makes fun of me so much. Like this isn't even a, she's just like, seriously, it's about ruins kind of thing. It's like, she's like, oh, you are crazy man and it's because i love anything that has to do with ruins like i don't know what it is in video games movies television shows whatever it is if there are ruins i am there like i am invested you just you put that in the backdrop and i'm like i'm gonna love this whatever it is we bought a house and there is a half standing brick wall in the backyard and i swear to you hand in the air right now that i walked out the back door we were with our realtor saw that brick wall like, oh it looks like like ruins and this is the house that we ended up buying and that was honestly part of it and it's silly but just seeing the remnants of a civilization knowing that the developers put this kind of stuff in and thought about a true history for this galaxy and this universe that's what really made me want to get into this game was seeing this and seeing these monoliths and ruins and everything that i'm just like i can learn more stuff i'm the kind of guy who will who will read a book and be more interested in the prequel than I am the actual story. I wanted the Star Wars prequels more than I wanted sequels just because I wanted to know what came before. I did it watching most TV shows that I have. So when I see ruins or something in a game like this, I am all in immediately when I can explore ruins. Yeah, I like the ruins too, especially because like that was kind of tied in with the alien language gathering. So that was uh-huh. one of the things that like I just ran into a lot of them while I was going around getting language words and um, <laughs> language words. But but, you know, the language I mean. words. And so, yeah, th- those were really cool. And I mean, I guess talking about the universe in general that's been created, the galaxy, it kind of brings us to probably like the biggest nit that I have to pick with this game. And it's yeah. the fact that it's procedurally generated, which isn't a bad thing. I mean, it makes it what it is and it has to be for what this game is. Yeah, there's no way you can handcraft every single planet in this game. Yeah, because if you don't know, I mean, if you haven't been following the hype, one of the things about this game is there's like 18 quintillion planets in the galaxy and you could technically run into a planet that someone else has discovered because like you upload all of your discoveries to the central server and it logs them. But realistically speaking, like I played 40 plus hours. I never ran into anything that anyone else had discovered or marked or tagged. Like you're not going to run into other right. players. This is basically a single player game. The The issue with the procedural generation is that after that magical first 10 or 15 hours, you start to see so many similarities that you see. And I was kind of hinting at this before but you see the edges of what the procedural generation is able to create and yeah. you feel like you've kind of seen it all even though you you haven't i mean there's still 18 quintillion whatever you know they're giant stat yeah. about how many planets there are and how many different species on different planets but you've kind of seen like everything it has to offer anyway and yeah that bugged me like that was the main turn off of this game in the end with where I'm sitting now at 40 plus hours of gameplay. And I think that was, I think you're right that that's what it is that really switched for me was that I'd noticed it way earlier than I am right now, but really started pushing through that the procedural generation never felt I guess random enough that I would see planets and it wasn't as though they were they were starkly different in terrain and and animals and flora and fauna and all of this which I understand are part of that but it never felt as though it was like really truly different that I would have either a sub-zero planet that I would be having to refill my biohazard suit for or it was acid rain or it was you know storms that were coming and then the minerals that I was getting were all the same it might have a pink atmosphere rather than a green one and through the first probably five or six planets this was 
awesome. I was going around, some planets would have more plutonium than others, some would have a little bit less thamium-9, and I'd be like, oh, great, cool, this is this is a different kind of planet. And then as I go, you know, half a dozen of those, I'm like, oh, I stopped even looking at the planets. Honestly, I started going from basically space station to space station, trying to move forward with what goal I'd set for myself and not uh, not really looked at the planet itself anymore. And that's bad. Yeah. Yeah. And I reached that point around where you are, too. So one of the examples of this when I was thinking it through is that. Like every planet, if you run into this little plant that gives you the isotope, I think it's called um, Mm thallium-9, it always looks exactly the same. If you run into a plant that gives you zinc, it always looks exactly the same. Uh, There's no like, like if you find, you can run into like a little hill or like a little mountain of a mineral or an isotope, but it's from a limited subset of them, right? Like you're never going to find a hill of zinc. You're never going to find a hill of whatever, but you are going to find hills of gold, but you're never going to find a plant of gold. It's like you once you see the limits they put on the procedural generation, you stop being surprised. And I think that might be the big thing is like when you run out of surprise, it stops taking your breath away. You know, yeah, and this is a game where it the entire I don't even want to say the entire purpose, but like the draw the draw of this game for me is having it take my breath away and have experiences more than having it gamified. So for that to happen, it really made me sad because I wanted it to be more than it was. Yeah. So, I mean, that's kind of the biggest thing is the procedural generation. Um, it is basically a single player game. And I know some people online seem disappointed, but I guess I always saw it as that way. Like, you yeah, know, you can upload your discoveries and other people might see them eventually. But it's not supposed to be a game where like I find you and we do stuff together. And that would be cool. Don't get me wrong. I've had a couple of discussions on Twitter with people about that. You know, Sergeant Bilbo was talking about this, about, you know, going out and exploring the galaxy with you and me. And that would be awesome. I would love to be able to do that, but I don't think it would be great in this game. I think that kind of thing has its place, and I love being able to group up and have exploration missions with people and co-op in games, but this particular kind of game, it may be because I've not really done online survival games before, but this one just feels like a single-player game, that this kind of survival, the entire atmosphere is set up to make you feel alone, and I was actually sad that there were as many aliens that as there were. I was I wanted to be more alone than I was. I wanted to be way more desolate and stranded and I don't even know what the word for this is, just de- not destitute, but that's the kind of the way I felt. I wanted to be more miserable than I was because I got into space and saw aliens everywhere. No, and I, I, was like, oh. I know exactly what you're talking about and um I think I we can jump ahead a little bit here to the, like the exploration section where I had thought about this a little bit. I think that part of the problem is that every single planet you're on, there have already been people there. Like there's already been aliens. Every single planet has structures on it. Every single planet has whatever kind of structure it is. And they're all pretty much the same. They're kind of these generic ones that can live on any planet. But if you look around enough, every single planet has a structure. Every planet has like some aliens sitting there in an outpost or a trading station. You're never actually the first person to find a planet, even though you're the first like human playing the game to find it. You Mm -hmm. are not the first creature to find that planet because there are people there with a trading post or people there with like a little station, you know, and that really bugged me after a while. One of my favorite movies last year and favorite books the year before that was The Martian. And it's all yep. about this sense of isolation and being completely alone on a planet. And you can never get that in this game. Like my favorite planets no. ended up being the ones that were called like dead planets where there was no flora, no fauna, no creatures roaming around. It was just this like barren wasteland and it kind of reminded me of Mars and I loved those planets. Those were the most fun I had exploring. But even on those planets, you could find shelters that were there that had aliens in them. It's just yep. like uh it just I know. You know. I felt the same way because you draw it to the Martian and I was thinking that about Interstellar that you see these just completely alien worlds in this movie where you know time passes differently the tides basically make the ocean move from one side of the planet to the other and this barren ice ball where they find their their friend or whatever he is and I wanted that that was what I wanted to 
feel like something that was just so grand in scope that it was the physics of the procedural generation may not have allowed that. I don't know if it's me or what it is, but I, I, you're right. It, I hated that there were people on those planets already. When I discovered a place by raising a flag that someone else had put down for me, I was like, this isn't discovery. That, that That's not me discovering anything on you know 8 14 2016 it's me clicking the button to save my game right and that took me out of it it made me sad because it drew me back from the immersion that would have been so easy to keep people immersed in just by allowing them to walk up there and plant their own flag but i mean there were things about the exploration that i did like so Mm -hmm. Like the first few times you find a planet and you name it and you upload it, it's really fun to think of a name of a planet yeah. and be like, I found this. I'm naming it something cool, you know? And then you name the solar system that you're in, you name the other planets in it, and you have this mm-hmm. whole little, like, you know, you have a solar system with planets and then the creatures on it, you can start naming the creatures and all those get uploaded to a server and it's there forever, well, as long as the game servers are running. And like, that was really fun. Um, my kids started naming stuff and they had a ton of fun with that. But again, this falls off over time. Like, right. <laughs> you know, I'm 40 hours in. The last probably 25 solar systems I was in, the last 20 planets I touched, I didn't name them. I just took whatever the default name was and uploaded it for some credits. Yep. Yep. That's exactly what happened with me. And like I said, I'm not as far in as you are where I was doing the same thing. And I named, you know, a lot of them at first. And some of them were really funny. I think I put in the poop galaxy at one point. It did not (laughs) stop me from putting in poop. But my favorite one was I was so just inundated with acid rain that I on the I usually waited until I got to space to name it after I'd experienced the planet and the solar system for a while. And I named this one on the surface of the planet while I I was hiding in a cave acid rain man acid rain <laughs> and because that was how i felt at that moment and nothing will ever take that away where i was just so frustrated with that acid rain constantly everywhere that i was having to hide in a cave i was like someone will see this eventually and know what to expect down here because it is everywhere yeah and- every once in a while i found a planet that was very much specialized in like one thing that it did really well and i would usually mm-hmm. name it after that one thing like if there's a ton of yep. one mineral there or if the sentinels are just like instant aggro and they kill you those are like the bad guy police force that shows up and messes with you you get into combat um like i would try to name it after that kind of thing but i also liked that because there's 18 quintillion planets or whatever it is (laughs) there's no way you can ever complete this game unlike other open world games right when you look at a map of like assassin's creed There are a ton of things to do, but you could sit down and 100% the game. It's not unreasonable. When you look at this galaxy, it's impossible. And because of that, I felt like a lot of the pressure was taken off to be completionist about it. I felt like I could land, I could hit a couple waypoints, I could explore a little bit, mine a little bit of minerals, and then move on. Like, I never felt like I need to stay here and finish this planet. And that is pretty much exactly how I felt about it, that I've gotten into a more of a completionist mindset lately, and this one just didn't, did not hit that with me. It really was all about the exploration, not the completion, that I didn't, I knew, because these planets are big, y'all. This is not even like a Star Wars The Old Republic or uh, Star Wars Galaxies planet kind of thing, where they're just zones, basically. These are planets. These are big, and they take days and months to walk across if you're doing it without your ship you will die unless you're very good at surviving maybe that somebody's going to make that mini game for them to walk from one point on a planet to another without their ship and just see what happens and good for them i don't have the patience for that because they are so flipping big yeah and it's really cool though that they are that big. yeah they're like planet sized planets which is interesting and i mean Speaking of like exploring the planet and trying to survive, one of the things about this game, like that crafting slash survival, I kind of mm. put those together, that crafting survival part of the loop. I, I'm i not a huge fan of survival games, but I was okay with it for the first few hours here just because it gets you into the game and it's kind of this slow ramp up and you start on a planet and then you expand to your solar system, you expand to the galaxy, you see it slowly open up. So I was okay with yeah. that part of it. 
the part I hated about it was that a huge part of this game turns into inventory management, and I hate that. It's never yeah. been a fun gameplay mechanic. It never will be a fun gameplay mechanic. And the main thing that you get from upgrading your suit or upgrading your ship, buying a new ship or whatever, is just more inventory space. And it's it's so annoying to deal with. And it's basically like you're buying a bigger backpack for 5 million units that it's very it's very off-putting to this to see because it's like you want the ship to go faster or you want the ship to have better weapons or or better armor and shields and you can craft all of those and put them in there but at base you are buying a shell of a you're buying a shell that has a bigger cargo bay in it that there are absolutely gigantic freighters that you can buy and you don't get to walk around in them you just have 15 extra slots than your starting ship or something like that. And those, I mean, that makes a huge difference. Like when you get 15 slots, it's a huge deal because inventory management gets so annoying in this game. And it's not fun. No. It is not a fun mechanic. I don't know at what point during the development cycle, if it was while it was still indie or while or after Sony picked it up, that the inventory management became a real core gameplay mechanic. But whoever did that needs to be fired because that more than anything else has made me stop playing the game when I've been exploring and having a good time. And I get to the point where my inventory is full, my ship's inventory is full, and things aren't stacking when I have so much antimatter to craft warp cells that I can't get any of the other stuff I need that it's ridiculous that's not fun it's just made me shut it's made me alt f for my game immediately after uh, hitting a save point yeah and I would say that like this game would be better if it just had like unlimited inventory space right from the beginning and you never had to think about it yeah and so one person did that. I don't know if you saw the article or saw an article about it, but there was one player who got a couple of uh, things written about him that he went entirely across his starting planet, upgrading everything until their max to where he crafted his ship basically out of crashes from his ship that he upgraded his backpack enough to where he maxed out his inventory and his multi-tool and everything on his starting planet and then went out into the wild. And that's a fun game for somebody. Like if there was an option to flip one switch to just turn on unlimited inventory right when you start the game, I would absolutely do it because it would make the absolutely. game better. It would make the game 10 times better. I was going to ask about this like crafting inventory management part. I'm, I'm wondering, was it better on PC? Because you played on PC. I played on PS4. Right. And on PS4, like I wanted this game because I thought it'd be good to sit on the couch and like do it on the exercise bike later. It's kind of a chill sit back game. And uh, I, I'm glad I grabbed it on PS4. But one of the things I don't like is that it basically has that proxy mouse control, which is what I think of oh. it. I don't know if it has a better name, but it's like the with same... the touchpad on the controller. Or? No, no, but it's like Destiny, where you use the left analog oh. stick to move around a little cursor, and like you put it over something, and then you hold the X button to like do an action with it. And oh, I just, man. I hate that. Like you have a controller. Why can't I just flick the stick and move it over one inventory spot? You know, like I want to yeah. hit the D pad to the right or hit the analog stick to the right and have it move an inventory spot over. I don't want this like fake proxy mouse on my screen that I have to move around with the analog stick. It just makes it more finicky. That would be terrible. I haven't hooked up my game pad to play this yet. It's been with a mouse and keyboard and the commands are intuitive. They make Makes sense. I'm put my mouse over something and I hold E and I get to craft at that point. I click on something and I install. I when something needs to be chosen, I just hold the left mouse button and move my mouse over it. The controls are wonderfully intuitive on PC. I cannot imagine doing the stuff that I have to do, flipping between different inventory screens with a mouse with a controller with a proxy mouse like that. That would be awful. But at the same time, I always flip it around and installing versus crafting is just the way my brain works. I had to think about it even saying there that I've written down in front of me looking at the notes so I wouldn't forget that 
it's for some reason the control while intuitive seems like it should be the other way i want to click something to start crafting and hold a button to install in my inventory to install an upgrade and i don't know why but i do and that's the only issue i have the only well i mean the other issue is that i'm playing it at a desk and i don't get to you know chill at a chill on my couch so i'm sitting at a desk with a mouse and keyboard so there is a trade-off that you are way more comfortable than i am playing this yeah i i don't regret playing it with the gamepad but it's just this little nitpicky thing that i, I don't like that control scheme i didn't like it in destiny in the menus either and if you play mm-hmm. destiny you know what i'm talking about it's basically the exact same way that you interact with the destiny menus i just think it's kind of like a disservice to console players because you could make it the other way and it'd be easier um mm-hmm that aside, I, I think I like the PS4 version a lot. I've heard some people are having issues with PC, but there should be a patch dropping soon for it. Have you heard what kind of issues? Because I haven't had, I've had one bug that, well, it wasn't even a bug. It was a glitch where I, z- I flew with my pulse engine directly at a space station. And when I got caught by the tractor beam to pull me inside, it glitched everything out. And I basically had to restart the game from my last save. I had to, uh, alt f4 it but i haven't i haven't had any issues so um i don't want to linger on it too long because i know it'll get patched out uh, but it basically like on si- some systems it's just unplayable or it has crazy mm. frame rate issues where it only goes like 10 frames a second and it just depends oh. on you just happen to luck out your setting is like your setup is fine but a lot of people it's yeah. basically unplayable just from a technical standpoint so that's that's okay. annoying yeah, that's the kind of thing that'll get patched out but it's awful to have on a launch yeah. So talking about like this core gameplay loop, um, part of it ends up becoming like the economy in the game because you want to upgrade your ship, right? You want to get a better right. spacesuit. You want to install new mods in your ship and your spacesuit and like upgrade them and get more inventory space. So there is an economy in the game and I feel like it's not super fleshed out, but I had fun figuring out ways to like optimize it and figure out the systems in play in the economy did you do a whole lot of this i basically just farmed around for some for some more rare elements and sold them as i needed to or not even as i needed to but as i filled up my inventory and then went to a space station or a a trading post and traded them off and sold it where that kind of thing has never really interested me in games i've never been a buyer and seller and trying to max out that kind of uh, virtual economy okay and that's fine that's a great way to approach it if you're just kind of casually trying to make some money in the game i like to find ways that systems can be broken or optimized i that's just something fun that i like to do in games I, I really like getting my head around systems in a game. And once I feel like I've mastered all the systems in a game or I've seen what they can do and seen the edges of them, that's when I start to lose interest in a game um, unless there's a narrative arc and then I will complete the narrative arc before I wrap the game up. And I, I, this is something I've learned about myself. I'm this way with my jobs and things I find interesting as hobbies too. Like I really like to dive in and learn a system. So when I did video production, I liked learning the entire thing from the top down. Basically every production like position you can do in a live production, I've done at some point uh, or another. Yeah. And then I ended up doing directing and producing, which is kind of like a step up and like higher level stuff. So yep. this this is not odd for me to like to figure out a system. So the economy in this game, the main point of it is basically to upgrade your ship and to upgrade your suit and the best way i found to do this that it kind of just breaks the economy is that in any given space station you can go and you can look at the galactic market you found this right the galactic market panel oh yeah 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 yeah. so if you go to that galactic market panel um every space station sells some of the same things and you can buy and sell some of the same items Mm -hmm. But every space station gives you slightly different market rates. So some of them sell them for like 0.06% lower than galactic average or 0.1% higher, things like Mm -hmm. that. But if you look, there's a little star next to usually one or two items in every space station. Yeah. And those will sell for like 100% more. So basically twice the price, right? Oh. So with those items... There's one called a dynam. It's like a dynamic resonator, and yeah. it sells. And you buy it and sell it for like a hefty chunk of change. And with that one, what you can do is that when you're in a space station, all of these other merchant ships come and they land, and that's how you can buy other ships. It's just by watching them mm-hmm. come to the space station and land. You can interact with the alien and buy and sell goods to that alien, or put an offer in on their ship. You noticed all this, right? Yep. Yeah. So basically. 
any of those merchants and traders have different galactic prices than the space station you're on. Yes. You go and you find a space station that has a galactic market that has a star next to dynamic resonator. So it sells for right. basically 200%, right? Like 100% above right. market rate. Then you just walk out onto the pad where all the ships land and you go from ship to ship, from trader to, to trader, uh. <laughs> buy every single dynamic resonator from them, turn around, walk back inside and sell them all on the market right there for double the price, turn around, that... walk back out and do it again. Wow, okay. That makes a lot of sense. I didn't even think I noticed that it did that, but I never thought about buying them from the from the pilots that were coming in like that. I mean, I was buying other stuff from them, but I never thought about buying what was, you know, selling for an absurd amount at the market. Yeah. So I did that for like an hour or two while I was listening to a podcast one day and I mm. just had like, I don't know, seven or eight million credits, something more than that. Mm -hmm. I think it was. I had a lot. I got all of the economy achievements in like an hour or two. And then I had tons of money to buy a ship, basically. So yeah. I bought a really cool Firefly looking ship that I love. That's still the ship that I have. It has a ton of inventory space. And I was kind of like, yeah, I don't need to grind out any more money to get a bigger ship. I'm yeah. happy with this to just play the game. And then you're going to have enough money to be able to upgrade your suit as you run across any kind of upgrades on the planets with exactly. no problem. So one of the things about the ship that I noticed is that you can't rename your ship. And to, no. me, to me, this seems like a huge oversight in a game where you can name like dirt, you know, you can name plants, you can name animals on all of these planets, you can name planets, you can name solar systems. The thing that's like core to you as a being isn't even yourself. It's your ship because your ship gets you around and you can't rename it. Like, how did they and how is this oversight in the game? That's going to have to be patched in. Like, I thought about that immediately because I remember playing Star Wars Galaxies and that being the the big drawing point for so many of my friends when we were playing it that you could name your ship and jump to light speed. That whenever the first expansion came out and they opened up space, that we were going to be able to get this and name our ships. I remember Star Wars Gra uh, Star Wars Galaxy Stratix, where I was an admin and we were we were all there were threads in the admin areas talking about what we're going to name our ships and why and what the history of that name is. Like we were crazy nerds about it. And then you have this game that is huge and you can rename everything like you said. And now we're going to stick with the uh, Snickleborf F37. And it's like, oh, cool. That's fun. I don't care about this ship. There's no personality here. Yeah. And in a game about space exploration to just not be able to name your ship, it feels, I don't know. I just, I can't believe that that didn't make it into the game. It is. It's just an oversight because in so much science fiction, I mean, the ship is as much of a character as anyone else. I mean, the Serenity, you talked about the Firefly ships, the Serenity is as much of a character in that show as any, any of the people are. Sorry, my, my having presented on uh, Firefly and done scholarship on it is coming out. But you do the same thing with the Enterprise, that Star Trek without the Enterprise is a space show. Babylon 5 is a big part of Babylon 5. And I mean, you have Battlestar Galactica, for goodness sake. These are ships that, that people know and care about. The Millennium Falcon, for goodness sakes. I mean... You cry when you see the Millennium Falcon in The Force Awakens, and they take that completely away from you. You No one is going to say, oh, look at my YT-1300 freighter that I got at the space station. It's like, no, look at my Millennium Falcon. And that's why that's why you should be able to name your ship. Yeah, you really should. I, I think that that's going to be something that they patch in. I can't see how they, they let to. that one fly after all the other things you can name. That's kind of our feelings about the core gameplay. Like, there's a lot of good there. And I don't want to overcast that with all of these nits to pick, but there are nits to pick. And I feel like a lot of this could be patched out. A lot of this could be fixed when they add more content to the game. They add more options yeah. to the procedural generation, like all these kind of things. And I think overall, this game is just strangely compelling in an interesting way. Like there were a yeah. couple nights where we were texting back and forth and both of us were like, I'm not sure how much fun I'm having, but I'm interested enough and I want to keep playing. Yeah, and that doesn't happen for me. That if I'm not having fun playing a game, then I'm usually like angry at it or frustrated and or bored. And I just put it down or go and do something else. But I don't know if I've had fun playing this game, but I'm glad I've played this game. I Yeah, me too. I'm definitely glad I played this game. Because it... 
it's an experience. Like the way that they put this together is, and, and for all of the nits that we've picked, they have put together a wonderful experience that I wish that they hadn't gamified. That I really wish it was like Journey or Flower or something like that and had taken it to the other end of the gamification spectrum where it's just like, let's go exist in this universe. Like, let's take out all the survival. Let's just explore and look around and name stuff. I would probably still be playing it if that were the case. And I I wonder, and this is more of a thought exercise than any actual like constructive criticism, but it makes me wonder that if they either added more systems to the game or less systems yeah. to the game, it might be better. If you stripped out a bunch of things and it turns into more of like a Pokemon snap like snap game where right. you're just going around exploring the galaxy, finding creatures, like that might be enough if you weren't trying to do all these other things on top of it. Or if they took all the gameplay systems they have right now and they actually like built on them all, because it feels like they have a the bones of a lot yeah. of good systems that need to be fleshed out and they're not fleshed out yet so the, it's yeah. in this weird in-between space where it's like it could be better with less systems or it could be better with more systems but what we have right now just feels like a strange place to be and what we have right now actually feels like an early access game on steam to me and i know that that's ridiculous to say and i know it's kind of condescending but what it feels like is because we're in the middle of this that it feels like it was coming in from two different development directions that that we have what is an indie game that's marketed like a triple A title and it falls between what both the mainstream triple A fans want and indie game players want and because of that they never quite made it merge that there are really 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 good things there but I just wonder I wonder if it was when Sony got involved that things started diverging and converging in the way that they have yeah and Sony I mean they hyped the heck out of this game like, oh yeah and I think that that might have been a disservice to this game overall because when I saw it highlighted in 2014 and it was just this little indie game that was part of other indie games they showed off at their press conference I was sold that was all I needed I said this is a really cool looking indie game I will gladly pay $30 on day one for this yep. and since then it's turned into this giant marketing machine that Sony has thrown at it and now it's a $60 game and I know that like $60 in a game means so many different things to so many people but to me it feels like maybe I should put it this way if it was a $30 game this would have blown me away in every way and yeah I would not feel like I had to pick all these things apart about it I wouldn't feel like I need to get into the little details about things that bug me because it would have been like an amazing indie game yeah absolutely that it's the kind of game where I really think that next summer when steam sale is on and you can pick it up for 22 24 28 dollars get it it's going to be patched there are going to be things going on and you're going to really truly get your money's worth out of it on steam sale on humble bundle sale whatever it is like that that even if all of these things haven't been patched out that they're not going to have the weight of that full new msrp on them yeah and i can definitely recommend this game at like a 30 dollars price if you ever see it for 30 dollars or less grab it like it's a great yeah. game for that amount i i don't feel bad that i spend 60 on it because i really like being part of just the talk about a new game when it's so big and so many people are playing it like that's worth the price of a new game for me and i know it's not for a lot of people but i love being part of the current discussion about new games that just come out especially when it's this huge industry phenomenon like all the blogs are covering it all of the major gaming news sites are covering it just a ton right now I feel like everyone I know who's a gamer is playing it. So it's really cool to be part of the discussion. But yeah. if, if you're not like me, you don't need that, then just wait on this one and grab it on Steam sale or grab it when, I mean, it'll probably go on PSN sale. It might eventually become like a PS Plus game. I could see that in a year or two. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah. So it's a good game. But again, $60, probably not for everybody on this. And another thing with this game is like, I'm probably done with it for right now because I played so much of it this week, but I picked it up because I know that this is going to be a great game this winter when I'm stuck inside on the exercise bike all winter. Yeah. Like I played this game after the first two hours, maybe I didn't listen to the sound at all. I had my headphones in. I was listening to podcasts. I was listening to audiobooks while I was playing and it was perfect. It's perfect to play while you're doing something else. So when I'm exercising on the exercise bike, sitting in my living room all winter, I'm going to play this game a lot, and I know that I will. Yeah, and it's going to be a game that I come back to every so often when I haven't been just diving in and having to come back for air. 
come back up for air that I'm going to go in, explore a planet, you know, see some weird space dinosaurs and then go do something else for a while. But I will be coming back to this. It's just not one of the games that is going to be able to consistently keep me playing just, you know, once a week. I'm going to be like, oh, I'm going to go on and play with my spaceship. It's like I'm probably not going to do that. Who do you think that just putting this, these recommendations out there with all of that said, who do you think this is for at like a $60 price point? Who would really get the most out of this game that would probably like it right now? Because for me, I think if you are a fan of a couple different genres here, if you're a fan of crafting survival exploration games and space games, this is your game. Like, do not hesitate. Go pick this up. You will love it. If you like some of those, if you like one or two of those, but you're not sure about the other ones, um, maybe wait. I, I think that's yeah. kind of how I feel. And I think that people who are like truly space junkies need to pick this up right now. That I've talked to a couple of my friends about it and who are just absolutely just nuts about NASA and space. And they are all in on this. That I was talking to them like, oh, yeah, I've already picked this up. You should you should see this stuff. And we were talking about it. And it's it's great. And that's kind of how I feel about it, too. It's like I just couldn't not experience exploring space like this. So if if you are you are the kind of person who loves space and has always wanted to be an astronaut like every you know eight-year-old has you should probably pick this up and try if you like flight sims ish that the controls in the in the spaceship fee- make it feel like a flight sim at times i didn't necessarily like the way the ship controls because i like arcade space games i don't necessarily like any kind of flight sim games then you know also if you like poop jokes and and things like that you should probably pick it up because you can feed animals and make them poop out presents and who doesn't love that i mean if you were the kind of person who liked world of warcraft's poop quests then anytime you find animals you can make them poop good things for you and you'll probably get you know hours and hours of fun off of this one (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> poop and ruins people that's all there is like i love poop and i love ruins and that's what's in this game oh man and i mean i guess if if you like games that don't have an end this one's probably good for you um there's a yeah. couple paths through the game but there wasn't quite enough direction for me i really like a, a well directed and crafted like narrative arc to follow through a game or at least goals that kind of take you from point to point and this has one path that's called atlas and i went to the end yeah. of that in about I don't know, the first 10 hours. It didn't take that long. And then I got to the end and I was kind of disappointed with what my options were because it wasn't messaged well what I should have done if I wanted to trigger this yeah. one thing. This is me talking around spoilers here. Um, there's one thing that if you have enough of an item by the time you get to the end of this path you can trigger something but nothing ever tells you that ahead of time no and you only have one chance to do it so i got to the end and it was basically like well you can't finish this path and then the other path to like quote unquote beating the game is to get to the center of the galaxy and (sighs) this is what i try to do for like the last 10 hours of my game i upgraded my warp drive as much as i could I added all these extra parts so I could jump farther with every warp jump. And I literally spent two nights just trying to, as efficiently as possible, jump towards the core. I think when I started the game, like the very beginning, hour number one, I was something like 175,000 light years away from the core. And when I was... Yeah, that's where I started, yeah. Okay, that's probably like the average it puts you. Standard, yeah. By the time I was done, and this was with shortcuts, with using black holes, with having super efficient warp jumping by the end and having it all down to like a system that was efficient, I was still about 150,000 light years from the center. Oh my goodness. And I, I was just, you know... If you're okay with a game that's an evergreen game that doesn't really have an ending, then yes, this is a game for you. If you want something that has good closure, um, hold off. You know, this is where pick it up on Steam for 30 bucks later or 20 bucks later, whatever, whatever your price point is. Don't jump in expecting a cool narrative arc that has a clear end because this game doesn't have that yet. And one thing that I will also say going in on the center of the galaxy thing i went and decided i know i'm never going to make this 175,000 light year journey like i just don't have it in me as a person to be able to do this so especially after i talked to you about how 
you know, how much grinding it came to just make those those last few hours of jumps that you did. So I decided to go onto the galactic map and basically go into free exploration and just zoom as quickly as I could toward the galactic core and just see what I could see. After 20 minutes of holding my W key down and just moving forward, I got bored, traveled about as far as you did. I got to about 160-ish, 150-ish thousand away and just said, mm -mm, I'm not even, I don't even want to see the map at this point so i'll eventually look up on the internet for spoilers on that one just to see what's at the center of the galaxy because i am legitimately curious what they have locked away behind all of that but it had really better be spectacular yeah and i mean i'll probably go watch a youtube video to see what happens when you trigger that atlas thing at the end of the path just because right. i couldn't do it because they didn't let me know ahead of time what i was supposed to do and I'll there's probably... one small message there is one that I noticed that that was at the very bottom uh, to try to talk around spoilers at the very bottom of the first major event that happens. There is a line that says, hey, you may need some things for you may need this for some stuff. But it's That's very it. it's very That's like unclearly messaged. <laughs> yeah, it is. That is as clear as it ever gets in this game. Hey, you might yeah. need this in the future for some reason. OK, I think I think those are all of our points out there. And again, we don't want to take away from the first 10 or 15 hours of this game no. really are magical. It's really a cool game. And if they patch in more content, if they add to the procedural generation, if they add more stuff to do or build on the systems, this could be an amazing game in another six months, three months, I don't know, year. But it's something to keep an eye on. This is just kind of our take on it after a first week of heavy play. So yeah, with all that said, it's probably time for our weekly geekery, which if you don't know, it's where we share what we've been geeking out about this week. What do you got for us this week? Okay, this week I really lucked out on Craigslist and I found someone selling a new 3DS XL and Xenosaga Chronicles 3D for a hundred bucks. So I snatched it up and I've been playing with that a lot this week outside of playing No Man's Sky. I've been playing Xenosaga and the 3DS. So this is a new used yes. 3ds xl or wait a used a new, used new 3ds xl yeah nintendo's naming scheme for the latest model of the 3ds is just dumb it, go look up new 3ds if you don't know what i'm talking about yeah and it's super hard you know the the person on the ad had said you know the name of the console is the new 3ds but it is used and so i was like okay awesome i know exactly what this is like they were very clear on that one and i really appreciate that and it's really really well put together but i haven't played around with the regular 3ds very much so i don't exactly know what quality it feels like but the 2ds feels kind of not cheap but you can definitely tell it's a lower quality console the new 3ds has some heft to it i mean it feels like a premium piece of hardware it feels like I'm, you know, you're going, getting out of the Apple store with this thing. When I picked it up, I was like, man, this is nice. And so I was really impressed that that for the price that Nintendo is charging for a new, new 3DS, it really feels great. The screen looks good. The touch screen's awesome. But I'm not sure about Xenos Chronicles, actually. We were talking about it uh, a couple of weeks ago in the JRPG episode, and I can tell that this is a super, really awesome, great game. And I actually wish that it was better. I don't know if I'm going to finish this one. You haven't played this, have you? I have not played it at all. I know that it came out, the original version was on the Wii, and then yeah. the um, the second game in the series is on Wii U, and since I hadn't played the first one, I didn't pick up the second one. Right. And I would have picked up the one that you did, which is the remastered, the Xenosaga mm -hmm. Chronicles 3D, but yep. it's only for the new new 3ds models or new xl 3ds models and i have an older xl model so i can't even play the game yep and it's it's okay i mean it's good it's a super great game don't get me wrong let me put it that way like i can tell why the game is is hyped like it is but the battle system is some kind of mix between kingdom hearts and final fantasy 12 is how it feels that there's a pseudo active like real-time role and I'm just not really into the story. Like, it's a super generic story. 
and I don't really care about these characters, so I'm not 100% sure if I'm going to finish this one or toss it on eBay and buy Kirby Planet Robobot. Yeah, and, you know, I've heard that it's a really big game, and it's a very ambitious yeah. game, and it's like... um. Of a nice fleshed out world to explore but it doesn't have a driving narrative that's great and usually for an rpg i need that narrative which is another reason that i yeah. just never really wanted to invest the time in this game it's as generic as most animes are and not to knock any anime fans out there but it is you know these robots attacked our village my friend died and now we're looking for vengeance and that's the driving conflict and i'm so not into it and i don't necessarily like the characters either that they're not interesting at all yeah that would that would definitely hold me back well and the other thing is that like i you were asking how long this game is so i went on uh, yeah. to how long to beat.com which if you guys don't know which about is this, awesome yeah i've used this site a ton over the past few years ever since i found it it's how long to beat Dot com and you can just google how long to beat and it's usually the top one that pops up but it's basically a game where any user can go in and you can submit your completion time for any game that exists so if there's a game that's been out for more than a week and you want to know how long it would take you to actually beat the campaign of it you can go on this website and find out and they have a couple different like <laughs> it's cool they have a, a different um play styles so if you yeah. want like main story so basically just critical path then there's people who submitted play times for that if you want main story plus a little bit of extras so just kind of like an organic playthrough you can see how long that takes people and if you want to see how long 100 percent takes there are people who do that too i went on to howlongtobeat.com and i typed in the game that you just got and basically it said like <laughs> 70 hours for a casual playthrough and that's a long time to ask for a game that doesn't have a great story yeah and that's really when whenever you i saw that whenever you sent me the link to that one it really was kind of i'm about seven hours into it right now and i realize that's not very far into an rpg but when i care as little as i care right now to play 10 times the amount that i'm playing right now honestly there are better games that i could be playing during that period period so i'm i'm sad because i've looked forward to xenosaga for so long and i mean i'm still enjoying it if you're the kind of person who doesn't care about that and likes massive worlds to explore you know it fits for the no man's sky episode of the podcast here maybe this is the game for you and i can totally see what the positives are on this one but i'll probably go play a platformer it may be what i'm in the mood for right now yeah sometimes you just need shorter games yeah <laughs> when it comes to jrpgs i I was really looking forward to Final Fantasy 15. And yeah. so one of my, it's not really happy, fun geekery this week, but the delay is official and it's not coming out until November now. I was really looking forward to like digging into this one in September. And yeah, oh, it's sad. But um, so for my geekery, I've been playing a couple games that I'm having a lot of fun with. One is called Reigns and it's about basically you have a, a kingdom and you're trying to have a ruler that reigns for as long as possible so it's that kind of okay. reigns not rain that falls from the sky and essentially the entire game is a series of left or right swipes it's made for mobile and it's it's from digital devolver who makes a ton of mobile games that i love and um i was talking to you about this mm -hmm. i'm appreciating more and more mobile games that are built for mobile that are made to be played on a touch screen because there are yeah. so many like big name games out there that they port to mobile and they kind of like force a control scheme that kind of works but i feel like that gives mobile a really bad name and you'll probably feel this if you play any of these big name games you, you know what i'm talking right. about right oh yeah absolutely i've been playing final fantasy 6 on my iphone and it is frustrating after having come from playing console rpgs for so long that the touch d-pad just does not work nearly as well as some touch rpgs i've played like arcane legends or things like that yeah so it's kind of frustrating but acceptable is a lot of those big name games that have been ported over to it games like reigns have been built from the ground up for a mobile platform and i love yeah. games like this this is where i know i've recommended card crawl before but i would put that into this category right it's made for a touch okay. screen it's great so reigns you basically have four different meters across the top there's I'm trying to think of them from left right there's a church symbol 
there's um, like a common people symbol, there's your military, and then there's your money. So okay. like your gold coffers. And you get just one, it's not even a card, it's like a one character at a time who's part of like your royal like inner circle, essentially. Yeah. You know? So this would be like your small council in um, Game of Thrones. Right. So like one member of your small council comes forward and they have some kind of issue or they have some kind of request. If you swipe one way, it'll give you one option. If you swipe another way, it'll give you a different option, right? So you always have two ways to approach every single problem. And it'll show you when you start to hold towards one direction, which of the things above it will affect and how much it will affect them. But it won't tell you if they're going to go up or down. Oh, wow. Okay, I, I could see how that would work. So you get a tiny bit of text, you see the person who's brought this problem or request to you, and then you can kind of slowly with your thumb just lean it one way or another and see which meters are going to be affected. And then you just have to make a decision. And when that happens, you'll see the meters that it had flagged either go up or down. You know, most of the time one will go up and one will go down, but sometimes all of them go up, sometimes all of them go down. You don't really know until after you've (laughs) made the decision. And the way that you reign as long as possible is to keep all of those meters in the middle. If any single one uh, of them falls all the way to the bottom or falls all, goes all the way to the top, you basically get killed. And oh. <laughs> it's amazing. So so if, for example, you the common people goes all the way down, they riot yeah. and they kill you, right? Okay. Whereas if something like like the church if the church power goes all the way up the church seizes power from you and kills you <laughs> like okay so, i see what you're saying yeah. yeah every every single one of those meters has a bad end condition whether it gets all the way at the top or all the way at the bottom so you have to balance all of these requests with what you think is best with these meters and not let any of them get too far one way or another and eventually you die like every king is going to die and then you pick up with that king's heir and you just continue on. And so it's okay. this like long legacy of king after king after king. And sometimes it's really funny because you'll just make like two bad decisions in a row and you'll lose on year two. <laughs> ah, yeah. Much like being a king. Yeah, exactly. So I like this game a lot. Reigns is super fun. I highly recommend it. I'll throw a link in the show notes. And it, I love finding games like this because they're made for mobile. And this is like two bucks, maybe three bucks. Like okay. it's, it's not asking for a ton of money and it's totally worth the cost of entry. The other game I was playing a bunch of this week that I've gone back to is Hearthstone. And it's not oh, to yeah. play multiplayer. It's because a new single player adventure came out. And I Which still are think so single good. player adventures are the best part of Hearthstone. Have you played many of them? This is actually the first of the Hearthstone single player adventures that I have not played yet. That I'll eventually get to it, but I love their single player adventures. The Black Rock Mountain, Dax Ramos, and uh, I loved the, the, is it the Explorers Guild? Yeah, it's the Explorers Guild. I loved. Yeah, League of Adventures or something like that. League of Adventures, that's it. Yeah, yeah. What? It's awesome. They're so cool. And I mean, um, part of it is like, approaching it for the first time and using your own deck to beat them which is okay but the real fun comes once you start getting into like the class challenge or yeah the special i mean most of them will have a couple special battles where they have a deck built for you that's unlike any other deck in the game and you get to pilot that deck and i've learned that for myself with um collectible card games or living card games like this i don't have fun building decks but i have fun Mm -mm. piloting a well-constructed deck so anytime that they give me a way to play a deck that i don't have to build and it's been built like specifically for the situation those are the times i'm having the most fun in hearthstone or any game like this is other ccgs i played and stuff too this one right when you start the first wing you have an intro and you get to play as medivh and you get a medivh deck which is super fun. And then you get um, two ones where you bring your own deck, and then the third one in the first wing, you get to pilot a deck that's basically a chess set. Okay, that's the chess one. Okay, I've seen a screenshot of it, and I didn't know how far into the into the adventure it was. Yeah, it's only the third battle after the intro, so it's like the fourth battle total. It's it's really quick towards the beginning, and it's super fun because your opponent only has a chess deck too, so it's a totally different kind of game than you're used to playing. And 
if the rest of these wings that open up week to week continue this trend, I think this is going to be the best single player Hearthstone adventure yet. Fantastic. That's high praise. I need to get on. I haven't actually had it installed for a long time uh, because it was taking over my life and playing it so much. But I need to get on and actually play this adventure and see because the first the first wing is free if you even if you haven't bought it, right? I don't know. I know they've done that sometimes in the past. I'm not sure with this one because I just I know that I love the single player adventures in Hearthstone. Right. So as soon as one goes on sale, I just buy the pack that gets all the wings. That makes sense. And that way you get the card back and everything, too. Yeah, I don't care as much about that part. I just care about the playing through the adventure. And then I I also really like the class challenges. As soon as you beat a wing, you unlock like the heroic class challenges and you have to replay a couple battles, but you have to do it with um, decks that Blizzard had designed for a specific class against that challenge. And I like that. And they're I, so I have fun. a ton of fun with that. Yeah, I just absolutely love those two. Like, you're absolutely right. The the ones where I have to build my own deck and try to take down a certain boss, I'm terrible at. Like, I just don't have fun doing that. I don't want to put together a different deck than the one I've been playing and tweaking. But when they hand me a deck and say, hey, be Medivh for a while, I'm like, yeah, let me be Medivh. All right. Well, I think one of the best things they did was with not this update for the single player adventure, but the big one right. before this update. Um, when they started their like their new system of whatever they're doing season to season, year to year, was the bat- last big update they pushed. And um, they changed like some of which cards are eligible for general play, mm-hmm. things like that. They made a couple different yeah. formats. When they put that into effect, they actually put a deck builder into the game where you can basically click make a new deck, pick your class, and then they have like three different well-constructed decks that you can pick and it'll just make those from your cards. And I think that's yeah. like the single best thing they've patched into the game since launch. Where they're actually good decks to play with and get you where you want to go. Where, yeah, you can tweak them here and there and you may not have all the cards to fill it out, but that they're still good, solid decks and probably way better than anything I can put together by myself. Yeah, exactly. They're not going to get you up to like the top tier competitive play, but that's not where I'm going to be ever anyway. So it's not a concern. Nope. They're just fun decks that are well constructed and you click a button It grabs all of the cards that would fit that deck. It throws them into your deck. And then if you're missing any of them, it will give you an option of like three replacement cards from your deck that you already own. So it's super fast, just a couple clicks and you have a well-constructed deck. So I love that. I didn't know that it gave the recommendations based on cards you have. So cool. I'll I'll end up doing that more. Yeah, because chances of you owning every single card Mm -hmm. are slim unless you, you know, you play Hearthstone every single day. So it will always give you options of, hey, you're missing this card, but here are three that will work in place of it. That's that's really cool. I really didn't know it did that. Yeah. Yeah, I like that a lot. So Hearthstone single player adventure. I'm having a lot of fun. Um, The next wing opens up either tonight when we're recording this or maybe tomorrow when the episode goes live. So I will be playing more Hearthstone. I will report back next week and tell you how the second wing is because I'm super excited for it. Yeah, you'll have to tell me how that is, because if the first one was that cool, then I want to know what the second one's like. I definitely will. And then the other thing before we start to wrap up, I just wanted to flag, we're almost at 50 reviews, recommendations, Yay! ratings on iTunes. Yay. So if you guys want to help us out, we try not to ask for it every week because I know it gets annoying. But seriously, besides if you have a friend with an arm's reach right now while you're listening, if you want to grab their device and subscribe to our podcast on it, that's probably the number yeah. one thing you could do to help us. True. The number two thing, just slightly below that, is to leave a rating or a review on iTunes. It helps more than you could possibly know. Like That affects how many people find us so much, it's unbelievable. So yeah. help us get over that 50 review rating mark. It would be amazing if I see that tick up over 50 this week, if you want to help us out. But as always, if you want, you can write to us with comments, suggestions, or feedback. Our email address is geek to geekcast at gmail.com or reach us on Twitter at geek to geekcast And if you want to get email updates about any of our network's podcasts, you can sign up at geek to geekcast.net and tell us which of the shows you want updates about. I blog almost daily at agreenmushroom.com and you can find me at GRN Mushroom. That's Green Mushroom without the E's on Twitter. I also run Video Game News Now, which is a podcast if you want gaming headlines done quick. And I'm on Twitter as at Professor Beege, that's Beege with two E's, and I host the Geek Fitness Health Hacks podcast, as well as blog at geekfitness.net and have sci-fi novels at www.bjkeaton.com. Lounge lizard voice. <laughs> We've been Void and Beege with your Geek to Geek podcast. That'll do it for this week. See you next week, geeks. 
can't take the sky from me. 